Hello, my name is Sydney Halpin and I'm the president of the New Jersey Jazz Society. I would love to welcome you today to this jazz education series between the Metuchen Arts Council and the New Jersey Jazz Society. For those of you that may not be aware of the New Jersey Jazz Society, we have just celebrated our 49th birthday this year. And uh, we are a small non for not oh, tongue tied. We are a small not for profit uh, dedicated to the preservation and promotion of jazz. Um, we are delighted to have partnered with the Metuchen Arts Council Jazz for this series. And we are thrilled to let you know that if you've missed any of the previous conversations, they are available on the New Jersey Jazz Society YouTube page. Um, for those of you that have supported us, have financially supported us uh, throughout this series, either organization, we want to thank you very much for your generous contributions. For those of you that are in a position to be able to contribute today, we would both be very grateful as we share the proceeds. Um, you can easily take care of a donation today on the New Jersey Jazz Society website page, njjs.org. There are several ways to donate. There is uh, a button at the top that if you push, it will go easily takes you through the steps. Um, we do process through PayPal, but you do not have to have a PayPal account to make the transaction applicable. So again, thank you very much for all of your past support and we look forward to uh, your generosity and help in the future. The New Jersey Jazz Society publishes a magazine, Jersey Jazz, 11 times a year. And because you're watching today, we would like to give you access to the magazine. It is, it is typically a benefit of membership, but today we're going to give you a free trial. Um, again, go to the website, njjs.org, and you can access the October issue with the password Satin Doll. Two words, space in between. Satin Doll is the password for October, and we hope you enjoy the magazine and would consider membership. Again, I would love to say thank you to the Metuchen Arts Council uh, for all the folks that are part of that group, as well as the Metuchen Arts Council Jazz, which has, uh, is our partner organization on this. And to that end, I would very much like to introduce the Metuchen Arts Council Jazz. I guess she, does she have the title of president? She'll tell us. Uh, the director of the Metuchen Arts Council Jazz, uh, Lynn Mueller. Lynn is, <laughs> hi Lynn. Lynn is an amazing ambassador for jazz. Uh, every time I'm in your presence, Lynn, I'm astounded at who you know, who you've worked with, and all the things that you have done in the name of jazz. So without further ado, I turn it over to you for what I know will be an amazing presentation with Frank Vasily. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, 49 years that the New Jersey Jazz Society has been in operation. That is phenomenal. And they really have helped grow jazz in New Jersey. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So we are very delighted to partner with New Jersey Jazz Society. And uh, thank you, Sydney, you are the president and Sanford Josephson, who is the vice president of publicity. Uh, thank you for taking this journey with us. We're grateful to have your significant help in publicizing and producing this virtual program. And of course, we thank Christine Vanderlis, the Society's amazing video and sound engineer for this event. She has been doing these events, every one of these for us, and she's made them flow without any issues. So thank you, Christine. Since 1968, Metuchen Arts Council, or MAC, has been the premier arts organization in um, Metuchen, New Jersey, supporting and promoting all aspects of the arts, visual, music, dance, and theater. Led by Chairman Bob Dykin, MAC is quickly gaining wider recognition throughout central New Jersey. Our website is MetuchenArtsCouncil.com. This virtual jazz education series joins our list of Metuchen jazz offerings, including festivals, concerts, and brunches. This is our fifth lecture in this series, and previous presentations are archived on the njjs.org website and YouTube so that you can view them at any time. 
Today's presentation is a first. This is the first time we will hear from a speaker who is predominantly a professional jazz musician. The New Yorker has called Frank Baselli a prized sideman. He has toured the world and recorded with many of jazz's finest musicians and ensembles, including the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, the Dizzy Gillespie All-Star Band, and the Christian McBride Big Band, among numerous others. Frank has been interested in music since grade school in Nebraska. He began by playing clarinet and alto sax, then after four years, he switched to baritone saxophone and never looked back. He continued his studies at North Texas State, where he was a member of the renowned One O'Clock Lab Band for six consecutive semesters. That's the best band at that school. Frank graduated with honors and a bachelor's degree in jazz studies. Then, in the summer of 2001, he became a member of the first jazz studies program at the Juilliard School in New York City. Frank is an adjunct faculty member of the new school and regularly also has been called upon to teach master classes at numerous institutions, including New York University, Eastman School of Music, Temple University, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and many others. Frank takes an active role as a leader of his own quartet, quintet, and sextet. He has released three recordings as a leader, and his band has headlined at many of New York's major jazz clubs. So please write your questions for Frank in the chat box during his presentation. Then at the end, we will have question and answer time, and he will answer them for you. Please welcome Frank Basili as he presents Evolution of the Baritone Saxophone, a personal perspective. Thank you, Lynn and Sydney, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the presentation today. Just uh, as a little introduction, uh, I'd like to thank the Metuchen Arts Council and the New Jersey Jazz Society for inviting me to be a part of this jazz education series. Um, and it's a real thrill to be a part of uh, you know, among all the distinguished, really fantastic presenters that have uh, presented this year, Ricky Riccardi, Sandy Josephson, Tammy Cronodal, Will Friedwald, and uh, upcoming David Haydu. Uh, so, and I also like to thank Noel Cohen, who uh, asked me about, uh, approached me about coming to do this. And again, Lynn and uh, Sandy Josephson, Sydney Halpin, uh, Christine Vanderlis uh, on the controls, and everybody else. Uh, my presentation today, as uh, Lynn was saying, is going to be not from the viewpoint of a professional writer, scholar, critic, historian, but from the viewpoint of a professional musician. Um, but you could also say within my role as a professional musician, I do sometimes wear those hats. Um, because I'm deeply invested in learning about the history of this music and uh, using the foundations of the masters who came before me to inform and further my own musical voice. Uh, as a professional musician, one of the things that I find myself doing from time to time is teaching private lessons. And uh, usually one of the first things I discuss in the lessons is what I think makes a jazz musician sound interesting and engaging to listen to. And the number one thing, first and foremost, is the sound uh, that he or she gets from their instrument. An instrumentalist's tone uh, makes up a large part of their musical identity and personality. It's the first thing that the listener hears. Uh, second in line is their time feel. In other words, the interpretation of where they place their notes with uh, relation to the beat. And third is their harmonic sensibility. That is how well the musician knows harmony in general, but specifically um, the harmony of the tune that they're playing at any given time, how well they play the changes. So when all three of these elements are strong and are working smoothly together, is when I get very excited and very engaged uh, to listening to someone. 
when an improviser combines a beautiful tone with a strong time feel and harmonic sophistication to create tension and release through beautiful melodies. That's a lot, that's a lot to do at once. Uh, that is what I'm listening for. So, of course, within these parameters, there's room for subjectivity. What may be a beautiful tone to one listener may be bland to another. What may be a strong time feel to one listener may be middling to another. And what may be harmonic sophistication to one person could be totally lost on somebody else. This subjectivity is, of course, great and makes for diversity, both in musical styles and in listening preferences. Uh, so I've devoted my life to jazz music and specifically to constantly improving myself as a baritone saxophonist. Uh, I take these things quite seriously and I am keen to borrow from those who in my own subjective opinion, I think are the greatest. Uh, plus it's simply just a lot of fun to listen. So the six baritone saxophonists I'm going to discuss today are always in my mind whenever I'm playing um, and they have blazed the trail that I strive to follow. So we're gonna start now with uh, Harry Carney. I'm gonna switch, there we go, Harry Carney. All right, so, and we're gonna go kind of chronologically here. Um, so no list of the great baritone saxophonists, whether that list is subjective or objective would be complete without Harry Carney. Uh, there are a few things everybody agrees on, but I feel that it is impossible to not like Harry Carney. Uh, most people agree that Carney produced the most wonderful tone that has ever emanated from a baritone saxophone. Indeed, one could argue that he produced the most wonderful tone to come from any saxophone or any other instrument. And, uh, you know, I know that's a lot of superlatives, but Harry Carney was uh, very special. Um... Carney's often imitated, never duplicated. His sound rings out clearly, boldly through the recordings he's on. I can only imagine what it would have been to hear him in person, which unfortunately I never, never had the opportunity to do. Um, Harry Carney was not the first to play the baritone saxophone, but he was the wellspring who put the instrument on the map. Um, and I don't think there's any baritone saxophonist that has not been influenced by Harry Carney in some sort of way. So uh, a little bit of biography here. Harry Carney was born in Boston, April 1st, 1910. And as a child, he studied piano, clarinet, and alto saxophone. And he was a uh, friend and neighbor of future Ellington bandmate and al alto saxophone great Johnny Hodges. Um, Carney's early influences were clarinetist Buster Bailey and soprano saxophonist and clarinetist <clears throat> uh, Sidney Bechet. Uh, so as a young alto saxophonist, Carney was gigging in Boston and would periodically make the trip to New York for gigs as well. Duke Ellington happened to hear Carney in New York in 1927, and he asked him if he would join his band for some upcoming performances in Boston. Um, it was with Ellington that Carney would remain for the next 47 years. Um, so when, uh, when hired by Ellington, Carney was still playing alto saxophone and clarinet. But later that year, 1927, Ellington's band was hired for the pivotal gig at the Cotton Club, and this required Ellington to enlarge his band. At this time, Carney added the baritone saxophone to his arsenal. So we're going to... Um, do a little bit of listening here. And uh, this is Harry Carney around this time period. Uh, you'll see he's still got the alto around his neck there, but he, uh, is a baritone. He's playing a baritone saxophone. Uh, the tune is Old Man Blues. And this was from a, uh, a short that the Ellington band was in called Check and Double Check. Uh, so enjoy, please enjoy Old Man Blues, Harry Carney. Whoops. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try that again. Uh, there we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so that was pretty great. <laughs> uh, but to to continue on, um, as Carney was playing the baritone saxophone more often and working towards its fluency and eventually mastery, he worked to incorporate two main influences: uh, those of tenor saxophonist Coleman Hawkins and bass saxophonist Adrian Rolini. And uh, as an aside, I've heard it said before that one of the reasons Harry Carney had such a magnificent sound on the baritone was because he used a bass saxophone mouthpiece. Now I can say that I have found no evidence for this to be true. I don't know if there's uh, how, how that uh, how that came about. I, I don't believe that is true. If anybody can can uh, prove that wrong, uh, I'd love to hear about it. But I, uh, I've heard that before and I, I think that is a myth. Uh, but anyway, uh, Carney would double on alto and baritone as well as clarinet through the early 30s and by mid-decade uh, with Ellington's saxophone section once again expanded from three reed players to four and soon to five with the addition of Ben Webster, Harry Carney would function in earnest as the band's anchorman on baritone saxophone, leaving all the alto playing duties to Johnny Hodges and Otto Hardwick and later Russell Proko. Uh, Carney also started doubling on bass clarinet more at this time. So uh, Duke Ellington famously composed music and wrote his arrangements with all of the individual and unique voices in his band in mind. Of course, this certainly applied to Ellington's writing for Harry Carney. Even on arrangements where Carney wasn't a featured soloist per se, uh, his unmistakable sound and unique interpretation of his parts added so much to the sound of Ellington's orchestra. Uh, the great paratone saxophonist and woodwind doubler Danny Bank said about Carney, the sound he got was unique. If he would miss a set, it sounded like a different band without him. Um, so a few of the many, many features Carney had with Ellington, Cotton Club Stomp, Jack the Bear, uh, La Plus Belle Africaine, Lotus Blossom, the Telecasters from Such Sweet Thunder, uh, VIP's Boogie, uh, Agra from the Far East Suite, and Sophisticated Lady. So I'd like to play uh, two of these right now. We're going to move to a great uh, video of VIP's Boogie featuring Harry Carney. <laughs> What a sound, what a sound, unbelievable. Um, and let's let's go uh, now to um, one of Carney's, I mean, this was like his big feature and this is Sophisticated Lady. And um, uh, at the end of this, I mean, he, he had this, well, we'll talk about it after it's done. Just, just enjoy Sophisticated Lady. Uh, one of our favorite uh, ladies, uh, Sophisticated Lady. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm good. I mean, I've, I've seen that like dozens of times, but like I get chills every time. That's amazing. So, um, yeah, that was uh, holding that note out at the end too. Uh, circular breathing. Harry Carney was also a uh, uh, pioneer of the technique of circular breathing. But that aside, you know, um, just the intensity of his sound, whether he's playing at a loud volume or a soft volume, it's just the sound is so intense. And I don't know if anybody has, has ever, uh, you know, recreated that intensity in a sound. Uh, but anyway, continuing on, uh, there were no shortage of Carney features with Ellington's band, but there were regrettably few recordings that he did as a band leader. Uh, in 1954, he recorded a wonderful LP for Clef Records, in which he is backed by a string ensemble called Harry Carney with Strings. Um, Harry Carney's big, beautiful sound um, is kind of the, the jewel in the crown of some very lush arrangements. Uh, seven years before that, 1947, Carney was featured in a similar setting with Strings for two titles, uh, Sono and Frustration, that were a part of a multiple disc album of 78s titled The Jazz Scene, produced by famous impresario Norman Grants. The year before that, 1946, uh, Harry Carney led an ensemble called Harry Carney's Big Eight, recording four sides for HRS Records. And he recorded an LP for Columbia Records in 1960 called Rock Me Gently, but this was only distributed in Europe for some reason. I'm not sure why. So when Harry Carney joined Duke Ellington, he was still a minor, and Ellington became his de facto guardian. 
Uh, from then on, he would develop a very close relationship uh, with each other, and uh, it would transcend that of music, musician and band leader. Uh, eventually, Carney would drive Duke from gig to gig in his Chrysler Imperial, and he became Ellington's confidant. On their close musical and personal relationship, Carney said, it's not only been an education being with him, but also a great pleasure. At times, I've been ashamed to take the money. After Ellington's death in May of 74, Carney said, without Duke, I have nothing to live for. And he died just over four months later in October 8th, 1974. Um, okay, so... Uh, I'm going to continue on now. That's the great Harry Carney. Um, we're going to move now chronologically to Leo Parker. Um, so uh, Leo Parker's baritone style combined the sonic might of Harry Carney, the bebop sensibility of Charlie Parker, and the rhythmic excitement of Illinois Jaquette. Um, uh, Leo, and I'm going to say Leo Thomas Parker, and I'm going to put that middle name in there because uh, I was just doing, I've been doing a lot of research on Leo Parker over the past few years, but I just found out his middle name. I don't know if that was widely known, it's just, I guess, a bit of a tidbit, but there you go. Leo Thomas Parker, born in Washington, D.C., April 18th, 1925. Uh, at the age of 15, he began studying alto saxophone, so that's relatively late, age of 15. Uh, while attending Armstrong High School and would eventually uh, begin to play at jam sessions around town. He moved to New York uh, in 1944 and was sitting in at Minton's Playhouse with the likes of Dizzy Gillespie, Lockjaw Davis, Thelonious Monk, and Max Roach. On February 16th and 22nd, 1944, uh, Leo Parker made his recording debut on the Coleman Hawkins sessions, which have since been dubbed the first bebop recordings. Uh, though Parker was still playing alto at this time, he did not solo on any of the selections. Um, uh, but the fact that the then 18-year-old Leo Parker was a member of this ensemble, led by the great Coleman Hawkins, speaks to the talent that he was already showing uh, and to the potential that the elder musician saw in him. Other members of the ensemble included Don Bias, Bud Johnson, Dizzy Gillespie, Oscar Pettiford, and Max Roach. And among the tunes recorded on these dates was the first recording of Dizzy Gillespie's now uh, standard, Woody and You. By the end of 1944, Leo Parker had joined Billy Eckstein's groundbreaking bebop big band. Initially, he was playing second alto, but the baritone spot, initially occupied briefly by Rudy Rutherford, soon opened up, and Eckstein convinced Parker to make the switch and fill the chair. Word is that Eckstein even bought Leo Parker a baritone. From this point on, the baritone saxophone would remain Parker's sole musical voice, and he would be one of the first and most successful adapters of the bebop language to the baritone. Eckstein's big band was groundbreaking because it was the first big band uh, to tackle the new form of music at that time, bebop, in a big band setting. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie, who played in the band at uh, various points, said, there was no band that sounded like Billy Eckstein's. Our attack was strong and we were playing bebop, the modern style. No other band like this one existed in the world. And Dexter Gordon said of the band, uh, there were crazy arrangements, wild young musicians, the esprit de corps. I was just thrilled. This was the kind of band that I think every musician dreams of playing in. Eckstein's arrangers included Tad Dameron, Jerry Valentine, Gil Fuller, and Bud Johnson. And the members of the ensemble included many of the progenitors of bebop, including trumpeters Dizzy Gillespie, Fats Navarro, Kenny Dorm, and Miles Davis, bassist Tommy Potter, drummer Art Blakey, uh, vocalist Sarah Vaughn and saxophonist Charlie Parker, Sonny Stitt, Gene Ammons, Dexter Gordon, and Lucky Thompson. Uh, quite a band. Uh, at one point, Elling, uh, sorry, Eckstein's saxophonists, uh, Sonny Stitt, John Jackson, Dexter Gordon, and Leo Parker became known as the Unholy Four. And uh, in her book called Sophisticated Giant, The Life and Legacy of Dexter Gordon, Maxine Gordon writes, 
about the unholy four, that they would sit in the back of the bus smoking reefer and practicing their parts. According to Dexter, this made them ready for anything once they arrived at the gig. And no other band's reed section could come close to matching their level of precision, precision and swing. Of course, they also got their name because of their unruly and ruckus behavior at times. Parker did not solo on any of the sides he cut with Eckstein, but during this period, he uh, recorded his first solo, which was made with Sarah Vaughn on her recording of My Kind of Love. Uh, other than a brief stint with Benny Carter's orchestra in late 1944, early 1945, Leo Parker remained with Eckstein's band through early 1946, at which point he worked on 52nd Street with Dizzy Gillespie's sextet, um, and Leo Parker was in place of Charlie Parker at that time um, at the Spotlight Club on 52nd Street. 1947 saw Parker joining Illinois Jaquette's very popular ensemble. The size of this band fluctuated, but it was usually a septet with four horns, Jaquette on tenor, Parker on baritone, Russell Jaquette or Joe Newman on trumpet, and J.J. Johnson on trombone. And three rhythm section, three in the rhythm section, Sir Charles Thompson on piano, Al Lucas on bass, and Shadow Wilson on drums. Uh, and since Jack Hatt's band was uh, considerably smaller than Eckstein's, uh, Leo Parker was afforded more space to stretch out soloing. And the band uh, toured a lot and recorded uh, quite a bit through this period. And 1947 was also a bit of a breakout year for Leo Parker. In addition to staying busy with Illinois Jaquette, he also recorded with the bands of Fats Navarro, Sir Charles Thompson, Gene Ammons, Dexter Gordon, and J.J. Johnson. And 47 was the first year that Leo Parker made his first recordings as a band leader himself. Uh, now, Leo Parker is the only one of these six who I'm talking about today. There is no video, um, no video of Leo Parker. Um, there is one video of Eckstein's band, and some sources say that Leo Parker is in the sax section playing baritone, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that is not Leo Parker. But we're going to uh, listen to a couple things. This is going to be... Uh, from the session um, with Sir Charles Thompson. He was on in 1947. And this is uh, features Leo Parker. This is one of his nicknames. This is called Mad Lad. Whoops, hold on. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> Lad, Leo Parker, 1947. Uh, okay, so Leo Parker left Illinois Jack Hatt's band in early 1948, and he set out to form his own quintet. 
Uh, Billboard magazine wrote, Barry sexist Leo Parker has left the Illinois Jaquette crew and formed a five-piece combo of his own for clubs and theaters. Associated Booking is handling his booking. And uh, Downbeat Magazine wrote, Leo Parker, who left Illinois Jaquette's sax section to form his own small band, has been breaking in with five men and a vocalist at the Club Astoria, Long Island. Uh, so his band toured throughout the year, but Parker's euphemistically termed health problems were catching up with him. On February 20th, 1949, there was a bebop benefit for Wild Leo Parker, as it was billed, uh, held at the Royal Roost in New York. Participants included Charlie Parker, Tad Dameron, Winton Kelly, Miles Davis, Cecil Payne, Max Roach, Kenny Clark, Sonny Rollins, Dave Burns, Tommy Potter, and Babs Gonzalez. Uh, the New York Age wrote, Babs Gonzalez will headline a benefit at the Royal Roost for one of his buddies, Wild Leo Parker, a sensational sax star just out of the hospital in D.C. So around 1950, Parker relocated to Chicago, and uh, I think he possibly raised a son there. I'd love to find more information about that, um, uh, if he has any, any living relatives, I'm not sure. Uh, he continued to record and gig sporadically during this period. By 1952, uh, it seems that Parker was in much better frame of mind and formed a new combo and hired a new manager. Parker would continue to tour as a band leader, mostly in the Midwest through 1954. And I have found no evidence of much activity from Parker after that until 1961, when uh, he launched what was to be unfortunately a short-lived comeback, thanks to tenor saxophonist and Blue Note Records a and man, Ike Quebec, Parker was hired to record for the label in September and October of 1961. He would record two LPs, Let Me Tell You About It and Rollin' With Leo. And another record date for Blue Note was planned, pairing Parker with uh, his old Eckstein sax section mate, Dexter Gordon. But Parker unfortunately passed away before it was to take place. Uh, he died of a heart attack February 11th, 1962, at the age of 36, just six days after recording with Illinois Jaquette for the last time. So I'm going to play you uh, just a little bit from one of these Blue Note uh, records. This one uh, is TCTB, Taking Care of the Business, uh, from Let Me Tell You About It, Leo Parker, Blue Note Records, 1961. <laughs> Fantastic. TCTB, Leo Parker. Um, so one of his last recordings. We're going to move on just to keep uh, keep it flowing here. And we're going to go on to Cecil Payne. OK. Cecil Payne, along with Leo Parker, was one of the first to successfully translate the essence of bebop to the baritone saxophone. Uh, Payne was born in Brooklyn, New York, December 14th, 1922 to a musical family. His mother played piano and his father played tenor saxophone. As a youth, his introduction to music was through singing and playing the violin and the guitar. But when a teenager, uh, Cecil heard Count Basie's recording of Honeysuckle Rose, which featured Lester Young, and that was enough to turn his attention to wanting to learn the saxophone. Uh, Payne's father bought him an alto and he was soon studying with Pete Brown, who happened to be a neighbor. 
Uh, Payne especially credited Brown for teaching him to master sight reading. Uh, Cecil Payne served in the Army from 1943 to 1946, playing clarinet with the 291st Army Ground Forces Band. After returning home, Payne worked around New York with various bands, including that of Clarence Briggs, and I'm not sure if that's Clarence Briggs or Clarence Berry, because multiple uh, sources I was coming across said either way. So if anybody knows, that would be great, either Clarence Briggs or Clarence Berry. But anyway, it was with this band that Payne first started to experiment with the baritone. At this time, Payne was also gigging a lot at uh, the 78th Street Tap Room with fellow Brooklynite and Boys High alum, Max Roach. Uh, Roach would soon recommend Payne to J.J. Johnson for a 1946 record date, uh, which was Cecil Payne's first recording date. Uh, he was playing alto uh, as there was a misunderstanding that Johnson actually wanted Payne to play baritone, but Cecil Payne's playing alto on this one. Another colleague from this time period, Clark Monroe, who owned the Spotlight on 52nd Street, recommended Cecil Payne for a spot with Roy Eldridge's big band on alto. As it turned out, Eldridge no longer needed an alto player, but he did need a baritone player. Payne volunteered and he got the gig. By this time, 1946, late 1946, uh, Payne would put down the alto and focus on playing baritone as his instrument of choice. Dizzy Gillespie happened to hear Payne with Eldridge's band at the spotlight and uh, hired him to play with his big band. Uh, Payne said of Dizzy's band, that band was the best I ever worked with for every reason, the music, the whole atmosphere, the guys. Payne featured, uh, Gillespie featured Payne on uh, such tunes as Stay On It and Ow. And uh, Payne would gig, tour, and record with Dizzy Gillespie's band through 1948. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit to uh, Cecil Payne playing with Dizzy's big band. But this was um, um, what he called his reunion big band in 1968. But um, here is Cecil Payne on Ray's idea with Dizzy Gillespie's big band. Whoops. Why does this keep happening? Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> All right, Ray's idea, uh, Cecil Payne with Dizzy Gillespie. Okay, so stepping back here, um, back into the 40s now. Um, <laughs> uh, Cecil Payne was on numerous record dates as a sideman with the likes of Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, James Moody, Ted Dameron, and Dinah Washington. But he hadn't yet made his first recordings as a leader. In 1949, he would cut eight sides under his own name for Decca Records. And uh, I'm not going to play any of these, but they're very interesting um, 
it almost doesn't sound like Cecil Payne. I think uh, whoever was in charge of these sessions was maybe uh, going for a very commercial sort of thing. If, if you can if you can find those, they're kind of hard to find, but they're very interesting to listen to. Uh, so anyway, uh, Payne was prized for his impeccable musicianship and his warm personality and continued to freelance with a host of top artists, including Ted Dameron, Dinah Washington, Coleman Hawkins, James Moody, Illinois Jaquette, Clark Terry, Kenny Dorham, Gene Ammons, Cannonball Adderley, Jimmy Cleveland, Sonny Stitt, Rolf Erickson, Machito, Woody Herman, and Count Basie. Um, in addition to Gillespie, two of Payne's most important associates, associates would be pianist Duke Jordan and Randy Weston. Uh, Payne gigged and recorded often with them both, and they shared a Brooklyn connection. In 1961 and 1962, Cecil Payne was part of the Jack Gelber off-Broadway play, The Connection. Uh, he was a cast member and in the live band and composed a new score. Uh, many of you may know that the original band and score uh, was by pianist Freddie Red, um, and the band included Jackie McLean. But Cecil Payne, uh, I guess, was in a uh, later production and composed all new music. Um, he was also part of the touring production that went to Europe in 1961. So I'm going to uh, play uh, a tune from this production. And this is Cecil Payne here. Let's see here. I'm going to switch here. This is Cecil Payne. Um, Recorded in Paris with Kenny Drew on the piano in 1961. And um, let's see here. I'm going to switch tabs here. Um, there we go. There we go. Now we're talking. Um, and... Here we go. There we go. We're back. <laughs> Cecil Payne, stop and listen uh, from the connection. Um, so Cecil Payne continued to freelance through the 70s, at which point he started to record more as a leader. Uh, but failing health had forced uh, him to retire from playing music in the early 90s. Uh, but his retirement was short-lived 
Um, Tenor saxophonist Junior Cook convinced Payne to play some gigs with him at Augie's Jazz Club, now known as Smoke. Uh, through these gigs, he began to play with younger musicians on the scene at the club, such as tenor saxophonist Eric Alexander, drummer Joe Farnsworth, bassist John Weber, trumpeter Jim, Jim Rotundi, trombonist Steve Davis. With these musicians, Payne marked a resurgence and made four recordings as a leader for Delmark Records. And um, we're going to play something else from that era. Um, and let's find it here. Okay, here we go. This is Flying Fish by Cecil Payne. There we go. <laughs> We're back again. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Cecil Payne's health continued to decline, uh, but the Jazz Foundation of America was able to provide him with Meals on Wheels, medical and housing assistance, and even find him some gigs whenever possible. Cecil Payne passed away November 27, 2007, at the age of 84. Um, OK, moving on. Um, Let's see here. Uh, here we go. We have Pepper Adams. Um, all right. Born October 8th, 1930, just outside of Detroit in Highland Park, Michigan. Pepper Adams and his family moved around a lot uh, due to the Depression. They ended up in Rochester, New York in 1935. Um, he had been experimenting with a piano by age three. And by the time he was in kindergarten, he would be listening to Fats Waller on the radio after school. How about that? Kindergarten. Wow. Um, he was exposed to classical music through access to his parents' uh, record collection. In second grade, he was taught sight singing in school. And by third grade, Adams was tuning in to hear live broadcasts from John Kirby's Sextet and Fletcher Henderson's big band. 
Uh, he started uh, instrumental education in 1942 as a clarinet in middle school. And he would also study uh, soprano outside of school, soprano saxophone. Um, and still, as a youngster, as a teenager, he was working in a local record store and in a theater as an usher. And uh, he would uh, use his earnings to purchase his own tenor saxophone. So we got clarinet, soprano, and tenor. Um, so March of 1944, Pepper Adams was able to see Duke Ellington's band three nights in a row at Rochester's Temple Theater. And he met cornetist Rex Stewart at that time, who was his favorite of Ellington's soloists. And Rex Stewart um, took him backstage and introduced him to the whole band, including Harry Carney and uh, the tenor saxophonist at the time named Skippy Williams. Um, so Pepper Adams was getting together with uh, colleagues in Rochester, listening, practicing, um, going out to hear music um, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. He found himself gigging six nights a week at a club called the Elite with a uh, sextet, which was described as uh, like a jump band. Um, and he was also gigging at another club in Rochester called Squeezers. And he was gigging so much that he dropped out of high school at the age of 16. So um, Pepper Adams and his mother moved back to Detroit in 1947. His father passed away in 1940. But before uh, getting to Detroit, they spent the entire month of March of 47 in New York City in order for Pepper to study with Skippy Williams, the uh, tenor saxophonist that he met with Duke's band. Um, and he also visited with um, his uh, slightly older colleague, Bob Wilbur from um, uh, Rochester, who was studying with Sidney Bechet at the time. And Wilbur even took Pepper to Sidney Bechet's place, and they all played soprano together. Um, so once in Detroit, uh, Pepper Adams found work in the city's automobile plants and started going out to the jam sessions. Um, he also worked at uh, the record department of a, a local music store called Grinnell's, and he uh, became friendly with an employee who was in the uh, repair department. And uh, this person told him about a student model baritone saxophone that had come in to the shop on trade. So uh, Adams was curious about the instrument and he was eager to find a way to be more employable in a city full of great musicians. Uh, so he used his wages and his employee discount to buy the baritone and uh, he loved it and was soon getting hired as a baritone saxophone, baritone saxophonist. Um, his relocation to Detroit couldn't have been timed better uh, he found himself in the middle of a tight-knit, fertile community of like-minded individuals. Pepper's colleagues included Barry Harris, Paul Chambers, Youssef Latif, Kenny Burrell, Donald Byrd, Frank Foster, Curtis Fuller, Tommy Flanagan, Doug Watkins, Elvin Jones, Thad Jones, and Roland Hanna. Uh, quite a list. Um, and there was no shortage of gigging opportunities or clubs to play in, and touring bands were always coming through Detroit. So now firmly established as a baritone saxophonist, Adams joined Lucky Thompson's short-lived Nanette in 1948, and later enrolled at Wayne University that year as a English literature major. Continued gigging, going to sessions, uh, practicing with uh, his colleagues. And in 1949, he would hear Charlie Parker in person for the first time at the Mirror Ballroom. Uh, and 1951, he enlisted with the Army and would be in the Korean War from 1952 to 1953, where he played in the 10th Armored Division Special Service Company's band. Um, returning to Detroit after his discharge, Adams easily made his way back into the thriving jazz scene. In January of 1954, he landed a six nights a week gig in the house band at the Bluebird Inn with a quintet that included Thad Jones, Tommy Flanagan, Alvin Jones, and bassist Beans Richardson. The band would sometimes host guest soloists, including a six week run with Miles Davis. The band would stay together until May when Thad left to join Count Basie's band. Later that year, he would join the house band at another club, Klein's Show Bar, with Tommy Flanagan, Kenny Burrell, Billy Burrell on bass and Alvin Jones. 
So Pepper Adams uh, moved to New York in 1956, and after a few months of making the rounds at the jam sessions, uh, he was recommended by Oscar Pettiford and Billy Root to join Stan Kenton's band, who he would tour with uh, from May to November. And uh, after his time with Kenton, he was briefly situated in Los Angeles, where he found uh, freelance work uh, with gigs and uh, in the studios. He would go on to tour with Maynard Ferguson's big band and with Chet Baker's band that included Elmo Hope, Doug Watkins, and Philly Joe Jones. And he would also record his first two records as a leader at this time. Uh, Pepper Adams Quintet on Mode Records and Critics' Choice on World Pacific Records. Named after uh, he won the 1957 Downbeat New Star Baritone Saxophonist Award. Uh, so let's see, by 57, uh, Pepper was back in New York, um, and um, he was recording with a uh, number of people, and uh, let's see, he teamed up in 58 with Donald Byrd to form one of the great quintets of the hard bop era. They recorded at the five spot during a lengthy engagement and would go on to record and tour the U.S. through 61. Uh, other important associations during this time were with the bands of Charles Mingus, Thelonious Monk, Benny Goodman, and Lionel Hampton. Quite quite a varied list there. Uh, the band Pepper is probably most associated with is the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra. Um, so let's see here. Uh, they started rehearsing in late 1965 and came to an agreement with Max Gordon, the club owner uh, of the Village Vanguard, for three Monday nights in February 1966. The band uh, was an instant success with fans and critics alike, and their three Monday night agreement kept getting extended. And as many of you probably know, the band is still playing Monday nights at the Village Vanguard, now known as the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. So Adam's tenure with Thad and Mel would run through 1977, uh, when he was one of only two original remaining members other than Jones and Lewis. Uh, the other one was uh, alto saxophonist Jerry Dijon. Uh, so let's uh, move to a, um, this is Pepper Adams uh, playing with Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, uh, and their jazz orchestra on tour in Denmark in 1969. Thank you. 
All right. Once around 1969, Pepper Adams with Thad Jones, Mel Lewis. Uh, so Pepper still kept very busy outside of uh, Thad and Mel's band during this time, playing with the bands of Teddy Charles, Duke Pearson, Elvin Jones, and David Amram, and recording with the likes of Stanley Turrentine, Blue Mitchell, Barry Harris, Dizzy Gillespie, and doing other various studio work. Now, when Pepper left Thad and Mel in 1977, he concentrated his efforts on leading and touring with his own small group. However, without backing from a major record label or booking agency, this touring was done almost completely with local rhythm sections. Uh, Pepper toured extensively as a soloist for the rest of his life, touring Europe multiple times a year, as well as occasional tours in the US and Canada. And in between these tours, he remained busy in the recording studios as a leader and a sideman. Um, so let's move to, um, this is Pepper on tour in 1978 in Stockholm. And here he happens to be playing in a band. You can see Clark Terry there, but this is uh, Pepper Adams uh, playing Daydream with a uh, local rhythm section in Stockholm. <laughs> Daydream. Uh, so throughout uh, his entire career, Adams was uh, always a musician's musician, highly regarded and esteemed by his peers, but uh, widespread critical acclaim was elusive. But as Pepper set out on this new path as a touring soloist, he began to receive some overdue critical, overdue attention from the critics and press. He won the Downbeat International Critics Poll Award for Best baritone saxophonist each year from 1979 to 1982. And in 1982, he won the Downbeat Reader's Poll Award for Best Baritone Saxophonist. He was also a four time Grammy nominee in the Best Jazz Instrumental Soloist category 79, 1980, 81, and 84. Pepper even performed on the live national television broadcast of the Grammy Awards in 1982 
And we're going to check that out right now. <laughs> Hopefully there are some uh, Muppet Show fans out there. <laughs> uh, so uh, the last few years of Adam's career were unfortunately filled with uh, hardship. In December of 83, he suffered a severely broken leg as a result of an accident in which his car rolled down his driveway, pinning him between it and the garage door. For the next seven months, he was confined to his bed and wheelchair and was forced to cancel all of his bookings. And then in 1985, Adams was diagnosed with lung cancer, but throughout his illness, he continued to keep a full schedule in order to be able to pay for his treatments. Pepper Adams passed away September 10th, 1986 at the age of 55. And uh, yes, I, I did want to uh, mention too, um, uh, Pepper's biographer, Gary Carner, uh, finished a fantastic biography on Pepper Adams. It's, it's just finished. It's available. Uh, it's not available in print, but it's available digitally. You can find the information at pepperadams.com. But uh, I've I've read it and it is uh, fantastic. It's a it's a great uh, biography, very informative, very well done. So uh, check that out. We're going to move on now to uh, Ronnie Cuber. Um, so another uh, Brooklyn uh, native. Ronnie Cuber was born. Christmas Day, 1941, in Brooklyn, uh, to a large musical family. His mother played piano. His father played accordion. And um, Ronnie Cuber started out playing clarinet at the age of seven and uh, was soon taking lessons at the Brooklyn Conservatory. And his father would eventually take him uh, on wedding gigs with him. So by the time he was in high school, uh, Ronnie Cuber and his friends were getting into jazz, collecting records, and he switched from clarinet to the tenor saxophone. Um, and he was tuning in regularly to the Symphony Sid live radio broadcast from Birdland. And uh, he started checking out uh, a lot of tenor players, Hank Mobley, John Coltrane, Dexter Gordon, Gene Ammons, Sonny Rollins, and of course, uh, alto man, Charlie Parker. So in 1959, uh, Ronnie was one of 428 New York area high schoolers who auditioned for Marshall Brown's Newport Youth Band. And uh, Brown liked Cuber's playing, but he already had enough tenor players. And he asked Ronnie if he would join the band on baritone if he bought him a horn. And Cuber accepted the offer and would stick with the baritone from then on. Uh, Ronnie's bandmates and the New Newport Youth Band included a number of future jazz notables, such as tenor saxophonist Eddie Daniels, trumpeters uh, Jimmy Owens, Alan Rubin, and Nat Pavone, pianist Micah Benny, bassist Eddie Gomez, drummer Larry Rosen. Um, as a newly minted baritone player, Cuber was working on developing his sound. He would start listening to recordings of Pepper Adams as a guide, and he would even seek him out for mouthpiece advice. Um, he would remain with the band for its entire two-year existence, recording three LPs for choral records 
and performing at Carnegie Hall in the 1959 and 1960 Newport Jazz Festival and at various festivals and dances on the East Coast. So, um, let's see here, okay. Um, there's some great footage from this band in 1960, and here's Ronnie Cuber soloing with the Newport Youth Band in 1960. So Ronnie Key was 18, so much, you know, showing so much musical maturity. I mean, that's, that was a heck of a solo. Um, so after the Newport Youth Band, Cuber would go on to continue playing with big bands in a professional context. He landed a spot on Maynard Ferguson's band, thanks to a recommendation from Micah Benny. He would also play with Slide Hampton's octet, and he toured as a member of Lionel Hampton's orchestra. And he didn't spend that much time with Hampton, but I got to play this video because uh, this is such a great solo. This is Ronnie Cuber with Lionel Hampton in 1965. <laughs> All right, great. Flying home, Ronnie Cuber with Lionel Hampton, 1965. So uh, Ronnie Cuber was a regular at jam sessions all over New York. He frequented W. Eugene Smith's loft on 6th Avenue, as well as clubs like Count Basie's Bar, Club Baron, Branker's Lounge, and the Blue Coronet. Uh, once, uh, and I love this story, uh, once at a session at Cafe Wa. John Coltrane came in. This is probably 1959, 1960. John Coltrane came in while Cuber was playing, and he was apparently so impressed uh, with what he heard that uh, he snuck back by the bass player and uh, he said, "Hey, who is that?" You know, he wa he wanted to know who that was. So uh, you know, that just shows you 
how great he was playing even, even back then. So as he was making the rounds, playing more gigs, gaining more visibility, he was approached by George, Men George Benson's manager, Jimmy Boyd. Uh, and after touring with Jack McDuff, George Benson was forming a group of his own. And Ronnie got the gig. The band would be together for about two years. They toured around the U.S. and recorded two fantastic records for Columbia. And they actually even appeared on the first ever made-for-TV movie in 1967 called The Borgia Stick. Okay, so after Benson's quartet broke up, uh, Ronnie Kieber would join the bands of Woody Herman, Dr. Lonnie Smith, and he uh, began his long association with Eddie Palmieri. And he worked in Aretha Franklin's backing horn section with King Curtis. Um, and Cuba's association with King Curtis led to consistent work in the recording studios. Um, so it wasn't until 1976 that he recorded his first date as a leader. He recorded uh, Cuba Libre on Xanadu Records with Barry Harris, Sam Jones, and Tootie Heath. And um, he's since gone on to record, uh, I think, about 20 records as a leader. Um, Ronnie Keever was a participant on Charles Mingus's last recording sessions in 1978, which resulted in the LPs Something Like a Bird and Me, Myself, and I. And Keever's association with Mingus led to him being a founding member of the Mingus Big Band in the early 1990s. The band's 1993 recording of Monin introduced Ronnie Kuber to a new generation of baritone saxophonists. And on a personal note, I am one of those baritone saxophonists. Uh, as a high schooler in Omaha, Nebraska, um, an aspiring uh, baritone saxophonist, uh, I, I had yet to discover any recordings uh, that really resonated with me. And one evening, uh, I was listening to the jazz programming on the local public radio station, and I was immediately transfixed with what I uh, what I heard. I pressed record on the tape I had in the tape deck, and uh, would eventually wear the tape out. I found out that what I was listening to was the then brand new debut CD of the Mingus Big Band and their recording of Monin, which featured Ronnie Cuber. Uh, and I said to myself, that is how I want to play. And this turned out to be kind of, a, in a way, like a life-changing moment for me. Um, as a result of hearing that and being inspired by the recording, I sought out Mingus's 1959 original recording of Monin, uh, which featured Pepper Adams. And that introduced me to the music of Pepper Adams. And I soon discovered Harry Carney, Leo Parker, Gary Simoleon, uh, so I, I, th I think I'm running a little bit over, but I want to play just a little bit of Ronnie Cuber with the Mingus Big Band uh, from uh, 2002. Thank you. 
All right. So, like I said, I think I'm I'm running a little long here. So, uh, we're going to move on to uh, finally. Uh, we have Gary Simonian. Uh, let me change the slide here. There we go. Okay, Gary Simonian, born April fourth, nineteen fifty six, in Bethpage, New York, Long Island. Uh, he began playing the alto saxophone at the age of eight, um, and his introduction to jazz didn't happen until the age of 13 when he happened to hear Fats Waller playing African Ripples on Ed Beach's WRBR radio program called Just Jazz. Um, so moving on, uh, uh, high school, Gary was a self-described Phil Woods acolyte who fell in with a tight-knit group of peers who were passionate about jazz in a very encouraging and fertile local jazz scene which was centered around a club called Sonny's Place, where Simoleon and his young colleagues would spend many nights every week to the music played by such heavyweights as Sal Nistico, Al Gray, Billy Mitchell, Sonny Payne, Roy Haynes. Uh, Sonny's Place would even occasionally host combos that Gary and his friends would put together. And he also had the opportunities to sit in with people like Jimmy Nepper, Ray Nance, Lee Konitz, and Chet Baker. And these experiences, along with mentorships from saxophonists Joe Dixon and Billy Mitchell, helped shape Gary Simoleon's musical identity. After high school, he enrolled at uh, SUNY Potsdam Crane School of Music and later would uh, transfer to Hofstra on Long Island uh, because he wanted to be closer to New York City. Um, so in May of 1978, just a couple weeks from earning his undergraduate, undergraduate degree in jazz performance, Simone got a call offering him the baritone chair with Woody Horman's orchestra. Uh, the recommendation came from Gary's friend and close associate trumpet, trumpeter Glenn Drews, who was already playing with Herman at the time. Even though Gary was a committed alto player and had never thought about picking up a baritone, he recognized this as a great opportunity to be working steadily 50 weeks a year with one of jazz's luminary figures. So he accepted the offer. He had two weeks to find a baritone saxophone before meeting up with a band, and he quickly grew to enjoy and excel at playing the baritone saxophone. He started to listen to many baritone saxophonists, and he uh, uh, to develop his sound on the instrument. Um, his position with Woody Herman's band cemented him as a bona fide baritone saxophonist. Uh, he recalls that one of Woody Herman's pet peeves was alto players who played baritone. But Herman liked what he heard out of Simoleon and gladly kept him on as a member of the band. Um, during this period of immersion into baritone saxophone styles, uh, he gravitated to that of Pepper Adams, which along with altoist Charlie Parker, Simoleon credits as his primary influence. With Herman's band, Simoleon would forge many personal and musical relationships that would remain important throughout his career with people like Joe Lovano and Bob Belden. Um, so uh, he would stay with Woody Herman for two years. And once he was off the road with uh, Woody Herman back in New York, uh, he started working with the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, formerly the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra. Um, he started subbing for the then baritone player, Gary Prebeck. And Prebeck soon switched to an open tenor spot, um, allowing Mel to hire Gary Simoleon uh, for the baritone spot. So let's see here. Uh, of of Simoleon, Mel Lewis said, Gary Simoleon to me has picked up where Pepper Adams left off. Uh, Gary plays like him, but he has his own thing happening. So he fits perfectly in the band. <clears throat> and uh, on his first exposure to Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra and the importance of Pepper Adams, Smolian said, Pepper Adams is largely the reason I play baritone. He left an unbelievable hole to fill when he left the band. Uh, and it's an honor and a priv privilege to sit in that chair. I first started listening to Thad and Mel's band when I was a teenager growing up on Long Island and still playing the alto saxophone. I listened to those records till the grooves wore out 
And I really heard, never heard a band quite like that. The idea that someday I would actually be sitting in Pepper Adams' chair playing the baritone was so off my radar at that point. And uh, let's see here. Um, Simone was quick to become a first call baritone saxophonist on the New York scene, appearing on numerous record sessions with uh, many great ensembles, the Philip Morris Super Band, the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, the Carnegie Hall Big Band, the Joe Henderson Big Band, the Mingus Big Band, the Dave Holland Big Band, the Dizzy Gillespie All-Star Big Band, the Jimmy Heath Big Band. That's a lot of big bands. <laughs> and uh, he's recorded with uh, Mike LaDon, Freddie Hubbard, Cedar Walton, Tom Harrow, George Coleman, Joe Magnarelli, Joe Lovano. Uh, always eager to stretch out as a soloist, Simoleon has made it a priority to lead his own small groups and tour and record with them. He has recorded nearly 20 albums as a leader for Criss Cross, Reservoir, Capri, and Steeplechase. And his recordings feature him in a wide variety of contexts from trios to quintets to large string and brass ensembles. And he's been able to uh, maintain a busy touring schedule in Europe and the US, usually with local rhythm sections as a guest soloist. Uh, Smolian is a favorite of musicians and critics alike and is recognized as the major voice on the baritone saxophone today. Many times over, he has won the Downbeat Critics Poll, Downbeat Readers Poll, Jazz Times Critics Poll, Jazz Times Readers Poll, and the Jazz Journalists Award for Best Baritone Saxophonist. His knowledge of harmony is without peer and his sound is one of the greatest on the instrument since Harry Carney. And um, I'm going to leave with uh, one one video instead of like three short ones. This one's kind of a little bit longer, but um, uh, this is Gary Simoleon playing trio, um, a blues he wrote called Blues for DP, which was uh, written for the great organist Don Patterson. This is Gary Simoleon, Blues for DP. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. Um, so uh, that, that kind of ends my presentation, but um, I think there may be some, some questions. And um, I don't know if uh, Lynn or Sydney uh, want to jump on, um, but I'm more than, more than glad to, to field any, any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Frank. An amazing uh, presentation. <laughs> Sorry, it went a little so, long. I was I was afraid it was going to be uh, too short, but it turns out it was actually a little too long. But <laughs> so so much in depth knowledge about these wonderful baritone players. I mean, some that I didn't even know, like Leo Parker. So uh, just just fantastic. And uh, Sydney Halpin has a question. It seems that many of the great Barry greats you talked about. Only today, only switch to the very out of necessity for a certain gig or group. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's just such a large instrument that I don't think, uh, you know, kids starting out, it wouldn't be a logical thing for someone starting out to to play. So, yeah, I think, you know, uh, most of these people started off on clarinet alto saxophone. That's actually how I started out as well, clarinet and alto saxophone. And then it, it, exactly as Sydney said, uh, as necessity comes in and uh, um, that's, that's when a switch usually happens for people. So do you think that in schools, the baritone saxophone is presented to students uh, when they first start out as a possibility? Do you think that's even brought up? I do not. I do not. And I think that's probably uh, for the better because I, I, uh, I think it, it's good to um, uh, learn on a instrument more suited, you know, physically more suited for like a smaller body. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it would make much sense to, to start on a baritone. Okay. We have a question from Austin Falvey. He has said, what advice would you give to an up and coming player to get their name out there? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I would really say um, wherever there are jam sessions, just to go out to jam sessions mm -hmm. and um, just kind of uh, show your face really and, and make sure that um, people are hearing you and people are seeing you and um, all that sort of stuff. And I kind of mean like in real life too. I'm not really talking about on social media. Like <laughs> I feel like you can post as much as you want on social media, but uh, <laughs> maybe there's an antiquated uh, frame of mind, but uh, 
I, I feel like that really does not hold a lot of weight. It's really going out there in person, making yourself heard and making yourself seen and uh, just forming as many um, uh, connections as you can with other musicians. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Okay, so uh, are there any further questions? I have one question um, about Pepper Adams and Sheila Jordan in Detroit. Did he know her as well? Uh, she was with that group. Yes, uh, I yes, yeah, she came up with with all those guys, and I I um, I do know that they they uh, they were colleagues for sure. Um, I'm not sure if they ever worked together. I I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but yeah, they they uh, they came out of that same you know, core of people uh, at that time that, um, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, I heard Cecil Payne at a club in New Jersey called Ishka Bibbles. Oh, wow. In Red Bank. Mm -hmm. in his later years, it was amazing. So my other question was, did he ever play at the Cornerstone restaurant in the Touchin? That I don't know. Uh, I did. I did have a chance to see Cecil Payne play, I think, four times before he passed away. And uh, one of those was actually I just happened to be in Los Angeles, and he was playing out there. He did a two baritone gig with Nick Brignola, so that was oh. that was uh, fantastic. Uh, Cecil Payne, and, and then I saw him. Uh, he did a concert at the Natural History Museum in uh, 2001, and. Uh, I saw him there and I saw him play once at the Catano in New York. And I think I may have seen him one other time, maybe at Smoke, I'm not sure, but I'm you know, mm -hmm. very glad to have had that opportunity. Certainly. Um, so of all those six that you talked about, who is your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Well, who is um, most influential on your playing? For me, the most influential would be Pepper Adams, um, uh, just because uh, you know I'm I'm very just very attracted to his style. Kind of those those um, things I talked about in the beginning in my introduction, just about you know when I'm listening to somebody, I'm thinking about the sound they get. I'm thinking about the way they play time, the way they phrase, and their harmonic sensibility, and the way all these things um, combine. And um, you know, talk about tension and release, and uh, beautiful melodies. Okay, so when all these three three things are kind of working together, um, you know, not all of one, not all of the other. When these three things are working together closely, um, and for me, um, I, I feel like um, you know, Pepper Adams style really combines all these three things in a way that to my ears is very uh, engaging. And uh, so I, I've, I've, I mean, I've taken a lot from all six of these um, people I've talked about today, but uh, the most I would say would be from, from Pepper Adams. So I heard Pepper Adams at a club in uh, upper New Jersey called Far and Away. Yeah. Did you ever hear him there? No, I mean, I actually, um, so I'm I'm not quite old enough to have even have okay. seen Pepper Adams. Um, I like to okay. think th th this isn't, uh, I'm sure this isn't true, but I like to think that uh, when, when he played on the Grammys, so I would have been about two or three, and I like to think maybe my parents had the TV on at that point, and uh, perhaps I saw that live when it happened, but uh, wow. no, I, I did not have the opportunity to see, uh, to see Pepper Adams, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, if there are no more further questions, um, we would like to say thank you very much to Frank. And today's program will be archived on the New, New Jersey Jazz Society website, njjs.org, and so you may reference it again, and it will also be on YouTube. If you like what you saw and heard today, and we know you did, please consider making a donation at www.njjs.org. Any amount is appreciated. Contributions are shared equally between New Jersey Jazz Society and the Touch and Arts Council and help defray the costs of these events. Our next Jazz Ed event is Sunday, November 21st at 3 p.m. when David Haydu, author of Lush Life, the biography of 
Billy Strayhorn will present Ellington and Strayhorn, alone and together. How two geniuses transformed American music on their own and as musical companions. We look forward to seeing you then, again, virtually live streaming. Stay in touch and let us know what you think of these programs. Thank you and goodbye for now.